Well, we know that polar coordinates are always useful when circles around the origins are involved, and that's exactly where polar coordinates are going to help us with double integrals. Let's get to it. Uh, basically, when you've got rectangular coordinates, and those are very inconvenient when we're modeling disks, because after all, we would need functions y equals plus minus square root a squared minus x squared to model the circle that gives the boundary. All right, now in polar coordinates, that would be a lot easier because we would just let uh, the polar variable r run from 0 to the radius of the disk, and we would let theta run from 0 to 2 pi, and that would cover the whole disk, right? So the question that we need to answer before we can actually go to integration is what the area element dA looks like in polar coordinates. And, and that is basically because previously, well, sure, I mean, we had rectangular area elements, so dA was dx dy, and that's how Fubini's theorem worked. So that, that was not a problem. But uh, when we are going to curved coordinate systems, all of a sudden we would technically have to prove a Fubini theorem that works for the polar coordinate system and for any other kind of curved coordinate system. And so the physical analog of that is to just determine what the area to determine what the area element looks like. The formal transformation theorem is something for a separate presentation on coordinate transformations in multiple integrals. Here we're going to take the geometric approach, which is the approach that you often find in physics as well as in engineering, and it works perfectly fine, and it gives the right result. Because if we're looking at area elements on Cartesian coordinates, well, basically, we would look at an xy coordinate system, and we know that the coordinate lines are the horizontal lines y equals constant, as well as the vertical lines x equals constant. And so then our area elements are a little step in the x direction, so a dx times a little step in the y direction, dy, and that's our dA for a double integral, and that is why uh, Fubini's theorem works. Now, if we're looking at that in polar coordinates, we have to remember that the, um, the, the coordinate lines, coordinate curves, and polar coordinates, even though we still have an xy coordinate system that we could overlay, are that we're looking at r equals constant, which are concentric circles, and we look at lines where, or at curves where theta is constant, which are these rays of the origin. What we can see, therefore, here is that the natural area element in polar coordinates actually is something that is bounded by two rays of the origin and then two segments of concentric circles around the origin. And one of the things that we can already realize is that if we make this partition fine enough, this will sort of look like a rectangle, but we still need to figure out what the links of the sides are. And so basically the polar rectangles and they literally are called polar rectangles that we're going to look at, are rectangles, quote unquote, that are bounded by an inner circle of radius A, an outer circle of radius B, and then they are bounded by a ray that comes off the origin at an angle alpha, and another ray that comes off the origin at, a, at an angle beta, and then the rectangle will be exactly this, and then of course for integration we have to partition that, and we do that with more concentric circles as well as with more rays of the origin and again we get these tiny polar rectangles that are our area elements. Alright, so what's the approximate area of a tiny polar rectangle? Well, we graph a tiny polar rectangle that starts at a point r theta and then just goes in a distance dr and so certainly one of the dimensions is just going to be the difference in the radii, which is ultimately going to be a differential length dr. Then we draw the segment of the concentric circle and again go in dr and draw the segment of the other concentric circle. And uh, well, that then tells us, of course, that as we go in all the way, that our polar rectangle starts at an angle theta and then ends at an angle theta plus a little d theta, a little distance in theta. And so again, if we magnify that far enough, if we make the dr and the d theta small enough, then this really is approximately a rectangle. The side length, the blue side length, will be dr, and the red side length will be just a, a little length of a circle that, that has been cut out of the circle by this angle d theta, and so that would be 
RD theta, uh, which is ds, and that's again just from the definition of, of, of radian measure, actually. Okay, so that means that the area of a differential polar rectangle is dA equals R d R d theta, and that means as a theorem, if f of x is integrable over the polar region R, where the polar region R is defined by uh, a less than or equal r less than or equal b, where we want to have a be greater or equal than zero, and by theta being between angles alpha and beta, then the integral of f over r is double integral of f over the rectangle r against the generic area element is integral from alpha to beta, integral from a to b, those are the bounds in r and theta, so that makes sense. And then we have f, and of course now that f is evaluated in polar coordinates, it's no longer f of x and y, it's f of r cosine theta and f of r sine theta, because that's what x and y are in polar coordinates, as we recall. And then this part here is the polar area element. So this is basically now something where we go back to this intuitive idea that the double integral is basically a continuous sum of values of the function multiplied with little areas. It's just that now the little areas uh, have value r d r d theta. And that formula works beautifully. And also, uh, for those of us who are concerned about the formality behind it, we can and will justify this formula also once we have the uh, general abstract uh, transformation formulas for double integrals and for triple integrals. It's just that, as I have mentioned before, integration actually is also formally very demanding. And so this geometric approach, because it gives so good results, really is preferable over going through, I don't know, a year's worth or two of graduate level mathematics to fully formally justify this. Okay, so we're already working with examples. Well, let's integrate the function f of x, y equals 2 minus square root x squared plus y squared over the half h of the disk of radius 2 that is in the first and second quadrants. Well, we can see already that that's ugly because if I had to integrate square root of x squared plus y squared uh, using dx and dy, that's something that I'm not sure even is, is possible in principle. Uh, but let's take a look at what the domain looks like. Well, so we get ourselves an xy coordinate system. We're looking at the half of the disk, okay, that is in the first and second quadrant. So we need the bounding circle, the bounding circle of radius 2. And so the radius 2 is here. And then the extent in the negative direction is, of course, negative 2. And the half of the disk is now um, marked here in red. Okay, so how do we integrate a function over this disk? Well, I don't want to do this in rectangular coordinates, right? Because when it comes to disks, polar coordinates are simply a lot more appropriate. So I would have the radius go from 0 to 2. I would have the angle go from 0 to pi. And that means if I make my d theta my outer integral, I would start with integral 0 to pi, integral 0 to 2 for the radius, 2 minus square root x squared plus y squared. That would be 2 minus square root r squared. And then I have the area element, which now is r d r d theta. And uh, yeah, the rest is just computation. And actually, the computation is surprisingly simple, because what do I get? I get 2 minus r times r, so that would be 2r minus r squared. So I have the same integral only of 2r minus r squared. Can you integrate 2r minus r squared with respect to r? Of course you can. We get an antiderivative r squared minus 1 third r cubed. And so we have integral 0 to pi d theta still on the outside, r squared minus 1 third r cubed from 0 to 2. Uh, if we plug in 0, we just get 0, so we only have to worry about the upper bound. So we get 4 minus 8 thirds. Well, 4 is 12 thirds, minus 8 thirds is 4 thirds. So we end up with the integral of 4 minus 8 thirds minus 0 minus 0, actually, here. So that would be the integral from 0 to pi of 4 thirds, and that's, of course, just 4 thirds pi. Uh, because we're integrating a constant, and that's it already. If we had set up this integral in rectangular coordinates, basically it would, it would have looked so horrible that uh, basically we probably wouldn't have even wanted to start that thing. That would have been an integral that we would have to grind through numerics. Um, well, that being said, it's still nice to be able to solve such integrals precisely because at the end of this presentation we're going to derive the 
precise value of the integral of the standard normal distribution across the whole real line, which is something that we had postponed from single variable calculus. Right now, let's just take a look at a few more things. For example, I may want to integrate the function f of x, y equals y over the region in the third quadrant that is bounded by the circles x squared plus y squared equals 4 and x squared plus y squared equals 16. Well, we've got to see that, so we draw. We give ourselves an xy coordinate system. We draw a circle of radius 2, which would be the circle x squared plus y squared equals 4. We draw a circle of radius 4, which would be the circle x squared plus y squared equals 16. We're interested in what happens in the third quadrant, so the region would be in the third quadrant here, which means it would go from theta equals pi to theta equals 3 pi over 2, this axis to this axis, and it would go, therefore, from theta equals pi to theta equals 3 pi over 2. We would go along the radius, we would go back, and we would go along the radius one more time. So this is the region that we want to integrate over, which means that, again, once we've got the picture, the rest is really just computation, because if we want to integrate the function f over this region against the polar area element, well, what do we have? We have theta goes from pi to 3 pi over 2 r goes from 2 to 4. The function is y. Well, y is r sine theta, and the area element is r dr d theta. Well, I think on the next one I just simplify that into r squared sine theta. Yeah, that's just the same integral only of r squared sine theta, and well, now I'm going to integrate the r squared, and that would mean I get a one-third r cubed. Sine theta really doesn't do anything. I could have also factored this out and computed this is a product of two separate integrals, but here you get one-third r cubed, and if you set it up like this, you just have to remind yourself that r goes from 2 to 4, and we don't substitute in for theta yet. Well, one-third r cubed, okay, so we would get at 4, we would get 4 cubed, which is 64, so 64 thirds minus 8 thirds here, so we end up with the same integral, 64 thirds minus 8 thirds times sine theta d theta, 64 thirds minus 8 thirds is 56 thirds, so we end up with 56 thirds times the antiderivative of sine theta, which is negative cosine theta, going from pi to 3 pi over 2, and here's where we have to count the negative signs, because, well, the cosine of 3 pi over 2 is 0, the cosine of pi is negative 1, but that is subtracted, so we get n minus negative negative 1, that's 3 negative signs, so we keep one negative sign over, so we have negative 56 thirds, and that's the result. Does that make sense? Well, actually it does, because when we integrate y over a region where y is negative, and that's what we're doing here, we've got to get a negative result, right? So this actually, at least the sign is correct, and the numbers should also have worked out correctly here. This, these are the kinds of little sanity checks that you also want to just execute for yourself to make sure that at least there aren't any gross errors in your computation. And these are also the kinds of things that you can ask yourself when you grind things through a numerical computation, because at the end you still want to make sure whether you have set up your integral correctly, and then sometimes you just push things the wrong way with the angle, and that typically then affects the sign, for example. Okay, well, what else do we have? I want you to compute this integral. Yeah, fantastic! Ah, uh, that's exactly the kind of integral that a couple of panels ago I told you we would want to avoid or only solve numerically, because after all, I don't know how to integrate the square root of 1 plus x squared plus y squared against dy, right? That is quite horrible. At least, ah, uh, yeah, okay, there, there probably are ways to do this with an integral table if you factor out the 1 plus x squared, but, I mean, this is, goodness gracious, this, this is getting bad, right? And so, rather than working this out in rectangular coordinates, let's just draw what the region looks like. Well, the region goes from negative 4 to 4, and we're integrating over a semicircle here, because after all, our y goes from 0 to square root of 16 minus x squared, and whenever you see something like that, you should have the reflex still from calculus or pre-calculus, that's a semicircle. It's the upper semicircle, and we go from negative 4 to 0, so it's the left half, of the upper semicircle. So actually what happens is that we integrate over a, a disk, over a quarter disk of radius 4, where we go from negative 4 to 0, y2, the function is 16 
minus x squared and we are integrating basically just in x from negative 4 to 0 and then from y to from 0 to 16 minus x squared and uh, so that is this quarter disk that we're integrating over. I think we're not going to have a y1 we just have this y2 here because I've been recycling slides uh, because most certainly these things take a while to make, right? Okay, so that's what we want to integrate over and that means that this integral in polar coordinates is an integral that goes in theta from pi over 2 to pi and in r from 0 to 4. So we end up with an integral from pi over 2 to pi, integral from 0 to 4 in the radius, square root of 1 plus x squared plus y squared is the square root of 1 plus r squared. Our area element is r dr d theta as before and now we can solve this with a quick substitution, right? Because if I do a substitution u equals 1 plus r squared, well then du dr is 2r which works out in the substitution in exactly such a way that this r here cancels the r in the denominator. Ultimately the rest is exactly just this kind of computation and if that substitution is something that you don't want to do mentally I don't blame you but I want you to do it with paper and pencil. I'm just going to show you the result here and that is that the antiderivative is one-third one plus r squared to the three halves and if you see something like that in a book at least as you read along you can quickly verify that that works out because if I take the derivative here I end up with three halves times one-third which is three halves times one plus r squared to the three halves minus one which is exactly the square root of one plus r squared times the derivative of the inside which is two r which together with the one half that we still had left gives us the r. This is the kind of mental calculation that ultimately if you can do it then this kind of stuff will not bother you at all. If not, look, there is no penalty for using paper and pencil. It's just that here I can also, uh, by not putting all this stuff in, I can put it all on one panel and quite honestly in advanced text people aren't going to put that in there. So I want you to get used to doing this mentally or with paper and pencil in the margin or in some separate notes that you take. All right, end of sermon. We have to keep going here. Uh, the upper bound is, 40, is 4, so we would end up with 4 squared 16 plus 1, 17 to the 3 halves, so 1 third 17 to the 3 halves minus, and at the lower bound this time we don't get 0, we get 1 to the 3 halves, which is 1. So actually what we have is that we keep the integral from pi halves to pi, 17 to the 3 halves minus 1 divided by 3. And if we integrate that d theta, well, that's just another multiplication with pi over 2. So the division by 2 would give us a 6 here. And the result ends up being 17 to the 3 halves minus 1 divided by 6 times pi. And so what we can see here again is even though it is just computation, I'm, I'm certainly still playing the taskmaster here. And I'm not going to apologize for that. I want you to be on top of these computations. This is the kind of stuff that we have played with enough in single variable calculus. And so now it is just time to step up and uh, kick it up a notch, as, as uh, a TV character also often said. And um, yeah, other than that, we can, I think, also agree that the integral is ugly at first. But by the time we reach this, we breathe a sigh of relief because this looks like something we can tackle and that goes back then also to the mantra that I certainly am repeating at, the, in, at this part of the course also and that is the beauty is no longer in getting beautiful results as in the answer is 2 or the answer is 4. The beauty in this stuff now lies in the very fact that we can get results at all even if the results look like this. Alright, we move on and we're gonna also take a look at what this does in Triple integrals. Well, polar coordinates, of course, don't directly connect to triple integrals, but we can encode a region in double, inter in double integrals, uh, in a triple integral as, uh, or with polar coordinates, and then just simply go in the third dimension. So, for example, if I want to compute the center of mass of the object to the right of the xz plane that is bounded below by the cone z equals square root x squared plus y squared and above by the plane z equals 2, well the first thing we have to do is we have to visualize it. We know what a cone looks like, we know what a truncated cone looks like, that would be something like, like a, a spinning top that you see as have, may have seen as a child's toy. And if we're looking at something that is to the right of the xz plane, then we just have to cut this thing vertically. So we have the stuff that is to the right of the xz plane, 
it ends at z equals 2. So this is pretty much the object that that looks like. Um, that is the object that is described here. And uh, yeah, now we can see, of course, that, that this is made for polar coordinates in at least the x and y dimensions, because we would just let our theta angle go from 0 to pi, and we would let our radius go from 0 to 2, and then z would actually go just from square root x squared plus y squared, which is square root of r squared, so that's actually really good too. So z would go from r to 2. So that means that the integral, uh, the, the, the total mass of this thing, and ultimately the center of mass formula we will also review, well, the total mass would be the triple integral of the density dv. And, well, whenever we've got that, we're going to assume here that this thing has constant density rho, and that's going to show that the density is ultimately going to uh, cancel out. So even if we don't have an explicit density given, typically when that is the case, we assume the object has constant density, because otherwise we would have told you how the density varies, and we just have to drag that through. Well, no problem. Well, and the other formula we need to recall is the formula for the center of mass, which is 1 over m times the triple integral of the generic position vector x, y, z of a point inside the object against the differential mass element, which is density times the differential volume. And again, we're just assuming that this object has constant density. The rest, because we already see how to set up the integral, the rest is quote-unquote just computation. Let's take a look at that. For the mass, we get that the mass is the triple integral of the density against the volume element, so that would be that our angle went from 0 to pi, our radius goes from 0 to 2, and then we had that z goes from square root of the radius squared, so z goes from the radius to 2, and then the density is just a variable, it's rho, and then we have dz, and for the double integral on the outside we have the area element r dr d theta. Well, that is something that we can certainly work out rather nicely, and again, the rest now really is just computation, because we factor out the rho, we get the integral 0 to pi, integral 0 to 2, integral radius to 2 of the radius dz dr d theta. Well, integrating that against dz will give us 2 minus r times r, right? And so that would be 2r minus r squared, because, of course, the r is constant, and so we just integrate uh, 1, so we get uh, z from r to 2, which gives us 2 minus r, and that is just multiplied out to give us this with the r. Now we have to integrate dr. Well, that would give us r squared minus 1 third r cubed, right? So, yeah, so we keep the row, we keep the outer integral. We have r squared minus 1 third r cubed from 0 to 2, which gives us 4 minus 8 thirds. Well, 4 is 12 thirds, minus 8 thirds is 4 thirds. So we have rho integral 0 to pi 4 thirds uh, d theta, so that would give us 4 thirds pi rho, because after all, integrating a constant just gives us a multiplication with the difference of the up between the bounds, so upper bound minus lower bound. And so the mass is 4 thirds pi rho, and so now looking for the x-coordinate, well, the x-coordinate is 1 over m times the triple integral over the object x times rho dv, which is 1 over the mass times integral 0 to pi, integral 0 to 2, integral r to 2, r cosine theta times the density dz r d r d theta. We're setting that up, and now we just have to keep computing, and we're going to keep the 1 over m out front because that would currently just clutter up the picture. All right, the rest is just computation. So we have 1 over m, we pull out the row, we again have an r squared, we've got cosine theta dz dr d theta, okay, we integrate against dz, and so that would again give us a 2 minus r, which gives us then, if we multiply the 2 minus r with the r squared, gives us 2 r squared minus r cubed, we keep the cosine theta, we've got the integral from 0 to 2 uh, dr d theta, and that gives us 1 over m times rho integral 0 to pi, well, 2 r squared gives us an antiderivative 2 thirds r cubed, r cubed has an antiderivative minus 1 third r to the fourth, because we have the minus sign here, from 0 to 2, that would give us uh, 16 thirds minus, uh, minus 4, which would be 16 thirds minus 12 thirds, which would be 4 thirds again. So we have 1 over m rho integral 0 to pi, 4 thirds cosine theta. And the integral from 0 to pi of cosine theta d theta is 0.
Okay, so we should have seen that one without the integral, um, even though the integral wasn't that bad. And of course, I, I set that up deliberately to just show you that it can and does pay to look at what the computations mean. We should have seen this without the integral because if we're looking at an object that has constant density, that is symmetric with respect to the yz plane, then of course the integral in x is going to be symmetric no matter how often it occurs in the triple integral, and that means the x coordinate uh, must be zero. Physically speaking, that also makes sense. This object will balance along any axis, at least in x, it will balance along any axis that we put through it that is, is going through the uh, yz plane, and so that means the x coordinate of the center of mass really must be zero here. Unfortunately, the other ones aren't going to be so easy because in z as well as in the y direction, we don't have symmetry. And so quick note to yourself, note to ourselves, when the density is constant, let's look for symmetry. That is something that can always help, especially for objects that have constant density. But now, well, so we'll do that from here on, but for this object, it's not going to work. So we have to bite the bullet and actually compute the y coordinate the hard way because there is no other way here. So y coordinate is 1 over m triple integral of y times rho dv, which is 1 over m, which we're going to drag through the computation, integral 0 to pi, integral 0 to 2, integral from r to 2 of r sine theta, which is y, times rho dz r dr d theta, which is the volume element. We have the z extent as well as the dA for the integral in the xy plane or parallel to the xy plane, and again the rest is just computation. So we write that up, we pull out the row, we keep the integral, we collect the r and this r into an r squared, we've got sine theta, we've got dz dr d theta. Well the integral against dz because r squared and sine theta are constants that'll just give us 2 minus r as an additional factor which then of course when we multiply the 2 minus r with the r squared gives us 2 r squared minus r cubed. Everything else stayed the same, right? 1 over m rho is 1 over m rho, the outer integral is still the same, we still have the sine theta, we still have the dr, we still have the d theta. All right, so now we have to integrate in dr, that would give us 2 thirds r cubed minus 1 fourth uh, r to the fourth, like we also had previously. Uh, so that gives us the 1 over m times rho from here, the outer integral 0 to pi d theta stays the same way, right? And uh, then we simply have the two-thirds r cubed minus one-fourth r to the fourth, which is exactly the antiderivative of what we have here. At zero, we get zero. At two, we get 16 thirds minus four, which is again four-thirds. So this time we end up with one over m rho integral zero to pi four-thirds sine theta d theta, but now of course the integral from zero to pi of sine theta is not zero. So we end up with, uh, yeah, okay, so the integral from 0 to pi of sine theta actually is 2, and that's because the antiderivative is the negative cosine theta, which at pi gives us 1, and at 0 gives us minus minus 1, and 1 minus negative 1 is 2. So that means we get an 8 thirds, and the 1 over m, because it's 4 thirds times 2, and then we have 1 over m and rho still kept. And now we have to plug in what m is. Well, m was 4 pi rho divided by 3, so that 1 over m is 3 over 4 pi rho times 8 thirds rho. The 3s cancel, the 8 and the 4 cancel, so, and the rows cancel, so we get 2 over pi here as the answer. And that certainly also makes sense because an object of constant density, for an object of constant density, the coordinates of the center of mass can only depend on the geometry, they can't depend on what the constant for the density is. And that's approximately 0.6366, which also makes sense because if we're looking at this uh, half of a cone that we have here, most of the mass is concentrated near the z-axis and that means that the y-coordinate of the center of mass must be closer to 2 than it is to 0. Okay, now I've, I've skipped some steps here, and again, look, it's just computation. In fact, in face-to-face in -face classes, I would probably often just skip the steps and just uh, give people the answer, because it takes quite a while to do these steps, because we simply would want to cover 
more examples we would want to cover more stuff where we do the interesting stuff namely the modeling in these presentations I've got a little, little bit more liberty because we can do these computations quickly because as you have already seen hopefully not to your chagrin these computations go a lot faster than a face-to-face -face class because I've got to rely on you to use the pause button wherever there is something where you need to fill in gaps and again that is the remainder reminder for the next one for the Z coordinate use the pause button as necessary here we go the Z coordinate is 1 over the mass times the triple integral of Z rho dV Z times rho not zero zero would be really nice but ah, yeah it's it's not in the stars for us here so that would mean we have 1 over m integral 0 to pi integral 0 to 2 for that uh, uh, for that half of a disk, integral r to 2, which gives us the integration over the cone of z times rho dz, and then r dr d theta is the area element in two dimensions. And uh, the rest is again just computation. Here we go. 1 over m rho, I just fold out the rho this time around. Um, the combination is really simple. I just pulled the r in. Actually, I should have left it on the outside, but either way, the antiderivative of z is 1 half z squared, which has to be taken from r to 2. All the outside stuff, as you can already see, stays the same. So we're really also practicing the reading skill here, which is we just focus on the stuff that changes. And, uh, well, 1 half z squared at the upper bound gives us 4 over 2, which is 2. And at the lower bound, it gives us 1 half r squared. So we end up with 2 minus 1 half r squared. And if I multiply that out with the r on the outside, I get 2r minus 1 half r cubed. Outside integral stayed the same. Right? We've got 1 over m rho. We've got 1 over m rho. We've got the integral 0 to pi, integral 0 to 2, integral 0 to pi, integral 0 to 2. And then we've got the dr d theta, which is also here. Integrating that against dr would give us r squared minus 1 eighth r to the fourth, right? Yeah, and so that's that. Again, outside stays the same. We keep the rho and the m. We keep the outside integral as it was. r squared minus 1 eighth r to the fourth at 2 gives us 4 minus, well, 2 to the fourth is 16. So 16 over 8, 4 minus 2 gives us 2. And uh, at the lower bound, we get just zeros. So we keep the rho and the m, we keep the outer integral, and the integrand is 2, which of course just gives us a 2 pi then, so we end up with 1 over m 2 pi times rho, and now we know that the mass was 4 pi rho over 3, so 1 over m is 3 over 4 pi rho, we keep the 2 pi, we keep the rho, we realize that the rho cancels as it should, we realize that the pi cancels, it doesn't necessarily always have to happen, but it does happen here, and then we have that the 2 against the 4 cancels, so we end up with a denominator 2, and we end up with an answer 3 halves, which again also makes sense because most of the mass of this part of the cone is actually near the top. And if most of the mass is near the top, then the center of mass ought to be closer to the top, which is 2, than to the bottom, which is 0. Okay, so the center of mass is 0, 2 over pi, three halves and again that makes sense and it makes sense because it makes sense because here's the geometric object right it's symmetric across the yz plane which means for constant density the x coordinate of the center of mass has got to be zero uh, and then most of the mass is near the x z plane and that means that the y coordinate of the center of mass should be closer to the left end than the right end, and it is because it's 0.6 something, which is closer to 0 than to 2. And most of the mass is near the upper end of the object, which is 2, not near the lower end, which is at 0, and that means that a 3 halves z coordinate also makes sense for this center of mass. Now, of course, we still could have had computational errors that are a bit more subtle, but at least but at least we have these sanity checks where we are connecting the integral and the computations to the physical reality, and this is a result that makes sense as we stack it up to physical reality. All right, that brings us to another part of physical reality, which is the standard normal distribution, where in 
a single variable calculus, we postponed a few things because we couldn't compute the integral e to the negative x squared over 2 dx because I, and we've, we've said that repeatedly, that is a function that doesn't have an antiderivative derivative in nice closed form. All right, so what can we do here? Well, if I square this thing, I might as well write that as the integral from negative infinity to infinity e to the negative x squared over 2 dx times the integral of negative infinity from negative infinity to infinity e to the nice y squared over 2 dy because there is no rule that says that I can't call my dummy variable x in one integral and y in another integral. But of course now I can pull this together and now all of a sudden this becomes a double integral. Don't worry about the minus infinity to infinity, that just means we're integrating over the whole space. So technically we're looking at an improper double integral and we're not going to go through the technicalities for that. But assuming that works out, and it does, we integrate uh, now e to the negative x squared over 2 times e to the negative y squared over 2. And of course, when you multiply exponentials, you add the exponents. And so the exponent all of a sudden is e to the negative x squared plus y squared over 2 dy dx. And hey, x squared plus y squared is r squared. And the area element in polar coordinates gives us an extra r, so we can do a substitution here, right? So this is the double integral over uh, the whole two-dimensional space of e to the negative x squared plus y squared over 2 dA. And if I can just massage my dA in such a way that it's going to spit out something that gives me a good substitution, and that's what polar coordinates do, I ought to have a chance to compute this. Now, we are certainly hiding, as I said, we're hiding against certain technical aspects that really are best left for an advanced calculus class or even for a beginning graduate level class. Um, in mathematics, we're just going to see here that as long as things work out, we will get the right number. And that's not bad either, considering that we just started working with calculus a little bit more than a year ago. Okay, so if we want to compute the integral of f of x, y equals e to negative x squared plus y squared over 2 over a disk of radius a centered at the origin, that's something that's, that's legit. That is something we can do. Sorry for the stutter there. Um, and if we then take the limit of the integrals as the radius goes to infinity, then that basically is the integral of this function over the whole space. And that is then something that we can puzzle apart again. So take the integral over this disk of e to the negative x squared plus y squared over 2 dA. Well, that'll be the integral from 0 to the radius, because we have to take, if we're going to get the whole disk, I have to let r run from 0 to the radius. Uh, and then the inner integral will be from 0 to 2 pi, because we have to go around the whole disk in theta. My area element is r d r d theta, and my function has simplified. My function is e to the negative r squared over 2, right? Another thing that we've talked about every so often is, even though it feels like we're adding insult to injury, after we've done all this stuff in multiple variables, the next thing that we always hunt for is that we try to get rid of some of the variables. And if I can turn an x squared plus y squared into an r squared, whether it is an integral that I'm talking about or whether it's a partial differential equation, I will always want to take that because the fewer variables I have, the easier the computation is. And here then, of course, I can puzzle this apart, right? I have an integral from 0 to a in dr of the function e to negative r squared uh, times r, and the rest of my integrand is just a 1, so I just have an integral from 0 to 2 pi d theta, which gives me a 2 pi directly. So if I work this out, uh, here is of course where I again want you to use paper and pencil. This is a quick substitution. The integral from 0 to 2 pi d theta, that's just 2 pi. That's not a substitution, that's a reflex. Uh, but what we have here is of course if I do a substitution u equals negative r squared over 2, then everything works out in such a way that I ultimately get this antiderivative here and because you're going to see this stuff in books, the way you read this is that you simply verify that it works out. And if I take the derivative here, well, the derivative of the exponential function is the exponential function itself. So I get e to the negative r squared over 2 back. Then I have to take the derivative of the exponent, which is negative 2r over 2, which with this negative sign really just gives you this r here. And again, with paper and pencil, work it out. The substitution is u equals negative r squared over 2, and that should be the only hint you need to solve this integral. Okay, we move on. We now plug in the 
bounds. And so now at r equals a, I get negative e to the negative a squared over 2. At r equals 0, I get, get e to the 0, with, with a, which with a minus minus is actually a plus 1. And so that means this is 2 pi, 1 minus e to the negative a squared over 2. And that is the integral of the function over, the, over this disk of radius a centered at the origin. So the first part is solved here. And now if I take the limit as a goes to infinity, well, as a goes to infinity, because e to the negative a squared over 2 goes to 0, that is 2 pi. And that means, with the information from the preceding panel, that that means that the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative x squared over 2 dx quantity squared is 2 pi. And that means that the integral from negative infinity to infinity of e to the negative x squared over 2 dx is square root of 2 pi, just as, as we claimed all along in the statistics portion of the single variable part of this course. So this is something, as you can also hear in my voice, this is something that math people are quite enthusiastic about, and that is because this gives us the exact scaling value that we need for the standard normal distribution, which is certainly nice. You have seen examples of just about anything that we can do with polar coordinates, so now it's time for you to look at some ugly examples of integrals in rectangular coordinates that, coordinates that we have to rewrite, or also at some integrations where you simply are integrating over stuff that has uh, that, that is circular in shape or annular in shape, two concentric circles and the stuff in between, or even parts of these things that are sitting in various uh, quadrants. Well, as you can see, I'm having fun with it. I hope you will have to. I'm going to take a break now. Thanks. Bye.